I want to welcome our incredible moderator and my partner in crime, <laughs> Maria Shriver, and our esteemed um, guest, Dr. Jackson Katz, Tony Porter, um, Jerry Tayo, and Josh Loves. Thank you all for being here. I want to thank everybody for coming uh, tonight to watch this film that Jennifer spent so much time on and um, that so many of the people who are on this panel have spent their lives uh, working uh, to create uh, the world that they depicted in this film. Uh, I've had the chance to work with many of them, but I want to say I want to thank all of them for their work, uh, for their voice, for stepping up, and for creating this uh, opportunity for men. Uh, that you have created by using your voice. And uh, I'll, we'll kind of skip through this. It'll be about, about 45 minutes. I hope we might even be able to get to some questions uh, from the audience. I know everybody's hungry, and there'll be dinner over at Brooks Brothers. But um, I think uh, you said so much in the film, and, but I want to get right into this discussion. What do you think is the most important takeaway that this audience can take from this film, Josh? Mm. So um, but part of what's so striking to me is, is something that was touched on here, which is that, and it's what I've spent the past year exploring for, for the book coming out, is that- Go ahead, pitch your book. Yeah, I know, I'm supposed to, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't ahead. want to talk about it all night. It's called All In, it comes out in two weeks, Harper Collins. But, but what it's- <laughs> the, We wrote an op-ed today together. Together, yes. yes we did an, together, guys. Huffington Post. <laughs> um, and so I'll, I'll just tell you all, so, so what I'm I've been exploring is this idea of, of how our structures, our laws, and our policies and stigmas are still acting as gender police in society, pushing men away from caregiving roles and pushing women into them. And so what I see that's so powerful in here is, is that, it, it really speaks to me, is that right now, yes, dads are doing better than ever. And that's something that you mentioned, Tony, at one point in there. Dads are, are more emotionally involved with our kids. Mm -hmm. Dads of young children today are um, setting really good examples at home. But I'm one of those dads, hopefully doing my best, and I have seen this problem as well. My eight-year-old son, who broke down recently, a few, just a few weeks ago, and uh, told me that he's not boyish enough. And it was just so heartbreaking, and I had no idea where that came from. Where does a kid get something like that when, when you know, I, I am here fighting this fight, and, and he knows other men as well. And what I realized is that these images in society are so potent that you know, I can't float over his shoulder when he goes into these social spaces. And in these social spaces, what's happening is there is such a dearth of men in general because of these policies, because in so many cases, men can't be as present as we want to be. So what you have is very few male teachers, which is a problem, very few male caregivers. And so you have this vacuum in which boys end up being the ones that you look to for what it's like to be a man if you're a kid. You know, kids, I've noticed since my, my, my kids were babies, they're surrounded by so many women and they need to be surrounded by more men. They have so many women caregivers and their mom's friends and their friend's moms and what we have is this, this emptiness, this vacuum, and a boy naturally wants to be a man, so who's he gonna look to? The other boys, and see what's cool, and what are they seeing in media? So what I wanna see, and if there's a takeaway, is that I wanna see men being more present in all these social spaces where kids are, more male teachers, more men doing, uh, being involved with kids in, in all sorts of activities, after school programs. Let's get the policies to free up men and women, both, to be able to have success at work and success at home, so that boys can be around all sorts of men, so they're seeing actual real life examples of men who are confident in their masculinity, instead of depending on media and social media and, and boys. Tony, you talk so much about the, the man box, and you talked about this kind of, that men are changing, but we're at a crucial point right now in society, where men are feeling threatened, and they're not really clear about who they want to become. In the Shriver Report snapshot that we released today, we said that men know that they, who they don't want to be, but they're not really clear on who they should be. Uh, yes, you know, a steep in the socialization of men, manhood, the collective socialization, we're taught to define manhood by distancing ourselves from the experience of women or at least what we perceive to be the experience of women. And distancing ourselves to do it and to do it most effectively requires us to develop a lack of interest in the experience of women. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't distance yourself and be interested at the same time. And so many notions, and, and that just, well that just in of itself 
you know, you know, very dear to my heart in the work that I do is really challenging violence against women, which, as I mentioned in the video, is that epidemic proportion. One of the leading causes of injury to women in our nation is men's violence against women, right up there alongside of uh, the various forms of cancer women experience and heart disease is, is men's violence against women. But we know that the more we increase healthy, respectful, responsible manhood, will decrease violence against but women. But we have to start that at a very early age, right? Jackson and I have talked about people start talking to, we should talk to the NFL. We should talk to grade school boys, right? Well, we it, can't it, wait to get no, to the no, NFL. No, we can't wait. And, and, with, and I appreciate the, the importance of talking to boys, and I also appreciate the importance of men talking to boys, but we have to talk to men. You know, we have to talk to men, and we, we talk about we want boys to spend more time with men, more time to do what? Mm -hmm. You know, we, want to, we say boys need to be with men to learn what it means to be a man. Well, what, what the hell is that? What, what it is means that? To Could be you man. answer that? What is that? You know, for me, what it means to be a man is no different than what it means to be a woman. It's about what it means to be a human being. You know, and, and, and that's what... <laughs> but that's, that's a part of the challenge that we're having as men. In your report, we're being challenged by the traditional notions of manhood. And the envelope is being pushed hard on these, tra these traditional approaches and, and gender roles of manhood. And so as men, we're grappling right now, which is a good thing. We're, we're struggling right now trying to define manhood, having been socialized to distance ourselves from the experience of women. So we don't know where the heck we're at in, 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 in many instances, which is a good thing. You know, because that's a part scary of the thing. struggle. It's a scary thing. It's scary because at the same time, you have men locking down, mm -hmm. you know, locking down on maintaining those images, those, those traditional roles and norms of manhood. They're locking down on that. And so it is scary. It's very scary. In a way, so, it's a mask, even for adults. But what know? do we do? I mean, you said you're, we're telling boys, even in this film, you know, be a man. What does that mean? What are we, I'm the mother of two boys. What does that mean? What do I tell them? I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't invest time in telling boys to be a man. I would put my energy in telling boys to be a human being, be a person, be good, be kind, be generous, you know, to be an individual you know, versus being a man. As, as, as Joe says, one of my mentors for as long as I've been doing this work, be a man is one of the most dangerous things that we can tell a man, you know? And, and, I'm, and, and let me say this, there are wonderful things about men, you know? I love men, you know? I love men, I love being with men, I love some of the camaraderie and hanging out, you know, with men, you know, with my buddies. I'm not trying to take that away, I'm not trying to toss that out. But we have to challenge particularly those notions of manhood that teach us to have less value in women, teach us to view women as the property of men, teach us to view women as objects, particularly sexual objects, how all of that at the same time holds us hostage as men. You know, uh, the, these are the notions. So I'm not saying everything about being a man is bad, but there are many notions of manhood that have to be challenged, gotten rid of, redefined. And we can't just teach it to boys. We put a lot of our investment in boys without teaching it to men. It's for all of us men in this room to look at that video and say, well, where does that still operate in my life right now today? And I'm trying to be a good guy. But where does all of this still operate in my life today? We have to develop a voice as men. We don't know how to talk to this stuff here, you know, and, and we're challenged that if we can't talk to it from a place of perfection and just stay quiet. You know, so much is going on that we're staying quiet to, that our heart is yelling out, but, we're, but nothing's coming out of our mouths. So, you know, it's a lot of work for we as men. I think if we're going to look at for men and boys, it's a top-down, bottom-up process. It's not just about working with boys. I'm not giving my son to men just so he could be with men. You know, it's, it, we all have our work in this here. I was talking with some boys uh, last night, and they were saying, you know, well, that's okay to talk about being empathetic and kind and caring, but if I stand up and tell other boys that, you know, I'm a good guy and I want to be kind and sensitive and caring, they'll be like, are you kidding? I could never stand up and say that. Jackson, how do we create a climate 
that boys actually feel. They can describe themselves that way, that they can say, hey, I want to be kind. I want to be empathetic. I want to be a different kind of guy. They'll get laughed out of the school. <sighs> <laughs> So or that's what I'm laughing. told. <laughs> um, no, thank you. Could I just say before I answer your question, Maria, yeah. um, I just want to thank Jen and her colleagues publicly for making this film yeah. and for creating this dialogue. <laughs> because it really, it really um, takes a lot of our work to a, to a, a, a much wider audiences of people. And you, know, you can just imagine how many people have already seen and will see this film, like saw misrepresentation that sparked so many ongoing dialogues about you know, images of women in media and the undermining of women's you know, self-worth and men's understanding of women as full human beings, not just objects. I mean, the, the power of film and, the, and, and harnessing the kind of ideas that you highlighted and the voices of men, you know, racially and ethnically diverse, gay and straight, older and younger, guys in prison, that, that's awesome. I mean, that's man, making the connection between guys in prison and guys out of prison, very powerful, great stuff. So thank you, and I'm honored to be part of it. I just wanted to say that. Mm, yeah. uh, okay, thank you. And then, I mean, I think building on what, what Tony uh, just said, I think the way to work with boys is to work with men. Um, I, I, and I think that for any number of reasons. I mean, I work in all kinds of different systems, in the military, in the sports culture, in schools, and I always say that the first people we need to get into these trainings are the generals and the admirals and the colonels, and, and in schools, it's the principals and the coaches and the athletic directors, and in corporations, it's the CEOs and the managers. Before we start talking to 18-year-old boys or 12-year-old boys, we have to talk to men, and we have to work with men, and men have to process some of our own stuff, like Tony was saying, before we can be the effective mentors to boys and girls on these, on these very same issues. And this is a challenge, because some of, this, some of these adult men, and I'm a, an adult man. I, I, um, but you are, call me adult men, and the, those generals and coaches, they don't want to work with Right, you. this is a challenge. I mean, I'm saying it's an, uphill, it's, an uphill, it's an uphill challenge. I mean, because a lot of those men are invested in ma either maintaining a certain pose of, of sort of coolness, or like, uh, or I'm, a, I'm an authority, I'm not, I mean, these are issues for our young people, but I, I mean, I'm an adult, and I've got it all figured out, which is, you know, bull, of course, no one has it all figured out. Mm -hmm. But I'm... It's, you know, a lot of men, adult men are, you know, have carry with them both the wounds of childhood and the, the, the stigmas of being on the playground and being ridiculed and they don't want to, you know, sort of take off their, their, their mask, if you will, their tough guys, as I refer to it, um, because it's being vulnerable. And so one, so one circling back, one of, the, um, one of the things I think we need to do, and it, it relates to your, you know, initial question, is we need to redefine strength in men. And acknowledging vulnerability is strength. It's not weakness. Saying that you're a, a person who cares and who's compassionate and who has, who has vulnerabilities and sadnesses, and that, that takes a great deal of strength. And the, the pretense of invulnerability is not a measure of strength. It's a, it's a, it shows you that you really haven't done the hard work of looking inward. Do you, were you, in the, in the report that we issued today, the poll, it said that men for the first time are defining strength, not in terms of physical strength, but in terms of character, values, and emotion. So to Tony's point, so men are changing. That, uh, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen that poll number. I agree, and, and can I just one one additional point? I agree 100, percent and I was encouraged by that particular piece that the courage and integrity and and res, you know being a respectful person are are qualities that a lot of men admire, which is great because obviously that's where we need to be heading. But um, this crisis, if you will, in masculinity that people have talked about, I've talked about it and written about it as well, um, is not new in American history. And this doesn't have to be a history lecture, but there's all kinds of periods in American history where you know, macro socioeconomic changes are occasioning new conversations about manhood. For example, when this culture shifted from an agrarian culture where a huge percentage of men were farmers into industrial, uh, the industrial age in the you know, late 19th century and into the 20th century, that, that occasioned a huge shift in gender norms and roles and structures because men were now leaving the home and they weren't in charge of the house at you know in, at, at all times they were now out in the factories that occasioned a huge crisis in masculinity in the early 20th century the boy scouts of america for example was founded in it was founded in modeling after uh, lord baden powell's founding of the boy scouts in in the uk because lord baden powell who was a military man um, 
saw in industrialization the, the creeping feminization of the culture, and he, he founded the Boy Scouts as a way, as a corrective against that feminization, so he was gonna teach the manly virtues. Now, I, I just wanna say, the Boy Scouts does, do a lot of good things. I'm not, this is not a critique of the Boy Scouts, although they've had their challenges. <laughs> um, but the point is that the, the, the founding of the Boy Scouts in around 1911 or 1912 um, was all about a response to this crisis in masculinity. But we're having, in the poll today, it showed that men are struggling because of women, or they say, because women have come into the workplace, because they've taken many of their positions of power. So how are, how are men adjusting to that? And once again, how do we encourage a climate where men can stand up and say, I'm cool with this? Well, that's honestly, that's one of the great challenges of our time. And I, I can make that a broad statement. It's global, it's not just local. Societies all over the world are struggling with this. That over the last couple of hundred years, one of the great stories in human history is women's organized efforts to, to, to be, achieve full status as citizens and human rights, just like men. And that's happening all over the world at different paces. And that's a great, great struggle, and it's a great advancement of the human species and in our civilization. At the same time, that's disrupted men's power and dominance in all kinds of ways, culturally, politically, and every other way. And so what we see all over the world are varying levels of backlash against women's efforts to achieve a certain level of status and inequality and equality as well as a growing number of men who are embracing women's equality and embracing the challenge and rising to the occasion. And if you want to think in evolutionary terms, our species depends on us figuring this one out because we are doing very poorly as a species in terms of sustaining our species. And again, globally, with all the inequalities that are structurally present, they're all, by the way, related. And gender is related to every other system and poverty and inequality and racism and all that stuff. It needs to be, you know, marbled together. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that it is encouraging that there is an awful lot of men who are willing to think about and talk to and work with women as our partners and our allies. And we're, this, all of us, this is a lifelong project for all of us in this room. It's not gonna happen in just a few decades. It, undoing thousands of years of patriarchal power and dominance is not gonna change in just a few decades. I mean, it's gonna change and it's not gonna, it's not gonna go away. And so it's all a lifelong project. Jen, in making this movie and all these people that have come here and um, what is the takeaway that you want them to leave this place with tonight? Do you want them to go home and talk uh, to the women in their lives, to the men in their lives, to ignite a conversation yeah. that's based on this film and the information that came out in the report today? Yeah, so, I mean, we want to have a national conversation that expands what it is to be a man that's about, that's redefining healthy, whole masculinity. Um, obviously, masculinity isn't inherently bad. There are all these incredible traits, but really, at the end of the day, it's about being a human being, mm -hmm. right? I mean, our boys, some studies indicate that our boys are more sensitive at birth than our girls, but that we socialize that sensitivity out of them. So it's just about expanding the conversation. And so please take this conversation home. Take it to the water cooler at work. Spread the word on social media. The other thing is we all have to model healthy, whole masculinity, and you guys do that, and that's why I'm so grateful to you and admire you and... Um, why you're in the film, and now two more men can be a part of um, the larger conversation, although you already are. Uh, but it, it really is about modeling whole, healthy masculinity. And then the third thing is that we have to support our boys in not disconnecting and not repressing their emotions, in staying true to their whole human selves. But that's a challenge uh, because guys, when you're talking to them and young boys, how you doing? Fine. <laughs> What'd you do today? Nothing. <laughs> I'm not talking about you, Christopher. Right, but right. Uh, where do you want to go to dinner? I don't care. Right. Uh, do you have anything that happened? No. Uh, so, you know, you got to really work it. You got to really, I mean, uh, it's. Uh, and doesn't it start at the very beginning, though, right? I mean, you're further along with, I mean, my son is only three, our girls sandwich him. And, but it, it's really, I, I don't, I, this is all an experiment to a certain extent, but not an, not an uh, I think, I believe a safe experiment, but I'm saying parenting is an experiment. Like, none of us really have experience <laughs> being parents, and we just follow, you know, others who we think are pretty good parents and try and do what they do. But, you know, with Hunter, it's, 
Um, he's, uh, I, I want to give him a voice. The other day he said, I am so frustrated. And just the fact that he used that language was beautiful to me. You know, I want to encourage his creativity. And so we cook together and he loves cooking. And, you know, yes, he's out there with sticks going because he watched some film that I, my husband put on for him and wasn't paying attention to. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was so, but what was so beautiful is his best friend is a girl who's a year older and, um, he incorporated that play with her, and Judy Chu in the film, she's conducted studies on gunplay and young boys, and essentially, the boys pick up the stick and turn it into a gun or an activity because it's about um, play and joy, and act, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to engage with another in, in a playful, lovely way. And at this birthday party the other day, Hunter, you know, he's, he had a male peer there, and they were doing their stick thing, and I was mortified. I just made the mask you live in. And, <laughs> and um, no, but, but in all seriousness, I, um, I, you know, reminded Hunter that this was his girlfriend's birthday. And he was so cute. And he engaged her. And he put the stick down. And it was just really, you know, it's the dignity. It's the, you know, learning early, at early and earlier ages, as much as we can help socialize our boys to stay connected and to not use violence and find their words and, um, you know, have that 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 um, inherent empathy that's that's inherent in all of us. Uh, we're in in good hands, and I and so I mean, obviously, not all of us have the good fortune of the time and the energy to spend with young boys. But I mean, I sort of a call to, out to all of you in the room that the more you can spend with young boys and guiding them and modeling for them healthy masculinity, the better off we'll all be. Jerry, I, I thought it was interesting in how many of the, in the exercise where boys were writing about the mask, how much, how many of them uh, talked about anger that was hidden behind. How big of an issue is anger? And um, I just wanted to, to talk, have you talk a little bit about how we deal with anger. And um, because it's out there. And I don't think we have a, a we're not well versed in how to talk to each other about the issue of anger and how, what we can do about it. Yeah. Well, I, and, and I think, you know, I mean, I've been called to preschools uh, with four year old boys that are angry. I remember yeah. getting called into classroom of four-year-old boy. He'd been kicked out of two preschools already. And, um, and they had him in time out. And, and I walked in, and, and the teacher began to tell me whether he, we think he's got attention deficit. He may be bipolar. He may, and, he, and, and I'm saying, what's his name? <laughs> you know, and so his name is Tomas. And uh, um, so, so who's his family? Well, uh, his mother brings him, but he doesn't have a father. And I'm saying, wait a minute, that's biologically impossible. You know? <laughs> but, but, but they'd already dismissed the father. It already, and we do that systematically, and the father's not around, there's no father. Or, and I, I got young boys, so I don't got a dad. I said, wait a minute, dude, you, you got a dad. Well, I don't like my dad. That's a different, different issue, right? But, but in this society, we, we can throw away fathers. We can throw away relationships we, because there's pain. And, and when, when the first, you know, first issue becomes that of confusion, why is this? Why am I feeling this? Why am I going through this? And, and you know, and I, you're think, talking about guns, and you know, I, I grew up in uh, in Compton. I grew up in Watts. I grew up in a neighborhood that that was uh, inherently violent, and, and but but on the outside, but but you know, uh, I had a grandmother that would love me and bless me, and 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 I'd go to my friend Tyrone's house, and his grandmother would bless him too, and I would hear these spiritual songs. So in those homes, we felt safe. You know, we we felt, but but we were taught that. That's not where you get success. You get it from outside, and your grandmother, because she was illiterate, well, you don't listen to her because that's not going to give you success. And, and the blessing, well, that's OK, but you really need a degree or credential. You need something else. And, and that was confusing. You know? uh, and I remember, you know, uh, so I grew up in that violence, and so I, we raised our kids. We moved out of that neighborhood you know, and, 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 and didn't even have my son play with toys, but have come, they, they do it with their hands. You know? um, and, and so raising this child, you know, uh, through him, through him, uh, really uh, attempting to heal myself. And we don't realize that, that really when you're with children and, and if you can, because the first lesson in life, we can talk all about you know, the, the cognitive stuff and, and manhood and womanhood and all that, but, but what we find is, is indigenous cultures all across the world. Many of them are matrilineal, right? 
And, and, when, and, and what happens when Western society comes in, it switches that, right? So that, that the matrilineal aspect, and you know, and I, even though I was told my father was the boss, I'd ask my mom, can I go out? She's wait till your dad gets home, right? So I'd wait and hear my dad's car, and I said, and, and then he'd come in, and I said, can I ask him now? No, let me feed him first, okay? And what, it, what I didn't realize till later, she wasn't only feeding him food, she was feeding him the information. Because if she wanted me to go, she said, good thing. She didn't want me to go, she said, oh, listen, no, go ask your dad. My dad was set up, right? <laughs> and what I realized is, is really, my mother orchestrated everything, right? And, 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 and the power of really setting up and the image and the reflection of who you are is given to children in, in a lot of different ways. So, so even in that household where you know, me and my wife were raising this son, there was a very different perspective. And I wanted, you know, because I didn't have that nurturance, um, the interesting thing that I didn't understand much later is my father. Uh, you know, he, he, I even criticized my father because I went to the store one day with him and he wanted to buy some milk and, and they wouldn't come to the counter because he didn't speak English and, and, and this man, that was sitting behind the counter playing cards with some other guys, call him a name, call him a stupid Mexican, make him wait. And I looked at my dad, and, and, and he didn't do nothing. And then they call him another name, and, and I'm looking, I said, and I'm thinking, my, my dad, you kick their ass, do something. You're not doing nothing, right? And, and, and so the man finally came, and he put the money down, and the guy threw the change down, and some of it landed on the floor. And so my father had to pick it up on the floor, and I saw in my father's eyes that shame that his son had heard that. And, 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 but by the time he got up, that look had changed. And, and we were walking out the store, and my dad grabbed his hat. That's why I wear a hat today, not because I want a style, but because my father wore a hat. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we walked out that, that, that but, but I was learning in school to use my words and share my feelings. So I decided to share my feelings to my father, right? Something that was, you know, was kind of irregular. But I said, so daddy, wh wh why do you let those men say those things to you? Be quiet. No, but, but why do you let them say ugly stuff? Like, you, you, you shouldn't, you're not supposed to let people say ugly, be quiet, you don't understand. And then I said to my father that I wish I could take back even today. I said, but if you're really a man, you fregado niño, he hit me like that. You don't understand. And we walked home and I looked at my dad. And in my mind, I was, I was a little boy, I was seven. And I looked at him, and at seven I said, I didn't say it, but in my mind I said, I don't want to be like you. You can't even stand up like a man. You can't even, def you let people say stuff about you. What I didn't understand is that my father would have said something. He, and sometimes just the presence of certain men, I mean, and I, talk, I work with a lot of men that are oppressed and say, I'd like to be gentle, but I live my life in fear. I walk in stores where they follow me, where I'm suspect all the time. So I can't take off that mask. That mask is 24-7, and it's heavy, and it stops me from sleeping. And my leg shakes all the time, and, and, I, and it physiologically messes me up. So, so as I was walking uh, home with my father, we didn't talk about it, because we don't talk about stuff like that. Uh, but I made a promise. I am never going to let anybody do that to me. And what I didn't understand is that my father would have done what I wanted him to do. He would have got arrested. If he got arrested, he would have lost his two jobs. He lost his two jobs. We couldn't have been fed. So my father sucked it up. And that courage of a man, sometimes just to suck it up, you know? And it wasn't about the sucking it up and all of that. It's just that I wish he would have had the words. What I began to understand, and now the, the, the the research will show you that some wounds are generational. Yes. So that, that sometimes, you know, that little boy, that four-year-old boy, that anger wasn't his. It was generational. It was, you know, and, and sometimes when I speak, I cry. You know, I was, I was speaking at a psychological conference, right, one time, and a psychologist came up to me after because I'd cried telling some stories. And, and, they, and they said, you know, um, I want to recommend a certain type of therapy that could help you so you don't break <laughs> up. You know. And I said, no, you know what? Uh, I don't want to stop crying because my elders and my ancestors have told me these are not my tears. These may be my father's tears. Maybe may be, a grand, it may be our grandmother's tears. And so there's a different dimension of what we're really talking about, that our world is wounded. And it's not just men that are wounded. Women are wounded. The elders are wounded. The children are wounded. 
right? And, and I have a really different experience. When we create a space for men, and I don't care how old they are, or boys, I don't care how they old, old they are, and we put them in a safe space, and we reflect the true nature, and we say to them, within you is that sacredness, and within you is that voice, and within you is that heart. Now speak. We can't stop them. And the tears flow, and the healing happens, and then we say, take this medicine and share it with somebody else. So that's the work that we do, and, and it's, it, you know, sometimes, yeah. We've gotten into this because of some of the Western ways and, and Western hierarchy and all of that. Let's not try and get out by a Western process. Yes. We have medicine, and we know medicine, and we know traditional ways. You know, and, and it's not coincidental that in Native American cultures, alcohol is a major issue. It's because of shame. You know, it's not coincidental that in certain communities, you know, black and brown communities, that, it, that drugs and violence are major issues. Those are survival coping methods, uh, uh, inappropriate. But, but it's, it's not enough, and I think you know, even we have these efforts you know, about uh, raising boys and, you know, and all of that, and, and mentors, and that's really important. But, but I, I want to agree here, it's not just putting men, you know, because you know, years ago, a number of us gathered, men gathered together, probably almost 35 years ago, we gathered because we saw some distress in the community. We wanted to do something. And we, we gathered, about 19 of us gathered together. And, and we're going to make a commitment. But we didn't know each other, so we went around in a circle. And the second guy says, you know, he's a professor. He's a PhD. He drives a Beamer. He's got a nice house. And, and spends a lot of time advocating the community. And, and he went to speak and introduced himself. He says, that's not my issue. My issue, I'm so busy working and advocating that I don't have a relationship with my son. Mm. How do I regain that? And sometimes we're so busy doing this work that we lose the essence of who we are. And as we went around that circle, every man in that circle was wounded. And we found out, before we help somebody else, we better fix this. And we realized that the, the most powerful influence we have is us, is healing ourselves and acting. And, and by the way, uh, I have seven principles of manhood right here. Oh, great. That, that I have researched and have elders have told me and wisdom keepers have shared with me you know, all across different cultures. And there are principles, way, way back, if you look way, way back, there are principles that are really, and it's really about humanness, yeah. but there are certain challenges that young men, I mean, women raise children all the time, and my mother raised us, but there's a certain point where you no longer can take your son in the bathroom. You have to say, go in the men's, mm -hmm. right? Well, what do I do in there? Well, just go in there and do it the regular way. Well, how's that? Well, watch the other guys, and that's why you got to rely on us, right? And, and the thing is that, that that's why we need each other. Thank you, Jerry, for, for sharing that um, story about your father. And I think what you hear, and you're talking, Tony, you talk about boys, you talk about men and the film. Um, and I think uh, I want to ask you, do you think women have been somewhat oblivious to the struggles that men are involved in today? with our own efforts to get out of the house and get into the workplace and prove our dominance, that we are blind to the pain and the woundedness of men and what men are going through. Before I answer that or yeah. give my thoughts about that, I want to just say one quick thing. Yeah. Because I was watching your son's face when you were talking about <laughs> the one word answers. Did I do something bad? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I have, what did I do? No, no, it just made me think about my son, oh, Kendall. Okay. They look maybe about the same age. Well, I don't know. My son, Kendall, was 17. How old are you? Yeah. And uh, what I had to train myself is the follow-up question. Okay. You know, I already know he's going to say good. Okay. And then I can just look at him after a while, and then he'll say, okay, okay, what was good about it? Because yeah. that's my follow-up question. Yeah. It's, but you know what, what's really going on is teaching our sons, our boys, teaching men to share from an emotional place is what's happening for us uh, because feelings and emotions have been cut off or sharing them have been cut off. We have them, but we've been taught, you know, not to, uh, to share them, which also then means we lack emotional intelligence as men. 
can't be intelligent about something you're not using or don't. And in some cases, our boys get to a place they don't even know they have them. So even, I was thinking, I was listening to Jerry, but I also was thinking about what you were sharing about, you know, the question around anger. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important that, that men know that anger is a response to an emotion. Right. It's an emotion, but it's a response to an emotion. It's a response to fear of pain. Two, two emotions that we've been taught not to even deal with. And I think, and I come back to the men in the room because it's our responsibility to be with boys. How often do we talk about fear? How often do we acknowledge that we're scared? How many of us would say out loud, I'm scared, you know, that things scare me and talk about what frightens me? How, how often do we talk, you know, we talk about anger, but anger, you know, is, is, a, is a response to fear or pain. And most of the time we're talking about emotional pain. How many of us talk about our feelings being hurt? Instead of saying I'm pissed off, how many of us say what's really going on is I'm hurting? You know, so it's, it's that emotional intelligence that we need as men, as Jackson was saying, to pass on the boys. How do we be with boys? You know, so our, you know, that, that's something that women have, again, distancing ourselves from their, their experiences. Women are, well, if my wife says to me right now, we got to talk. <laughs> Is right. I go through a whole experience, right? A whole physical experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because that's the man in me, because that means emotions. You know, when she says, we got to talk, that's all she got to say is, we got to talk. And I go through a whole physical experience. I think it's, <laughs> it's really incumbent upon we as men to really, you know, we say things like get in touch with emotions, but that, you know, that, that's kind of in some respects at times making a joke of it. We lack emotional intelligence. And, and that does not and has not served us well that anger becomes the only emotion that we as men have permission, that we give <laughs> each other permission to express. That's, that's lethal, you know. But I want to ask you a question about women because... If you look at the producers of this film, you can start with Jennifer, include yourself, include Jessica, and all the other women. It's women that put this project together. You call upon us to participate, but women put this together. Nine out of 10 times, wherever I go to speak to men, and I know it's the same exact experience for Jackson and Jerry, wherever we go to speak, to men, nine out of 10 times, I was invited by women. So much of what I know about engaging men or the issues of manhood that, that challenges manhood, so much of what I know, I learned from women. I put a spin on it or I, 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 I ground it in what I know about being a man and what men can hear, connect with, and I bring it to men in that way. Mm -hmm. But the basic foundation of what I'm talking to men about, I learned from women. Now, women will come to me at different times and say, you know, I didn't think about it that way. Or I learned something, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's all cool. And that happens. So yeah, women do learn or make a connection with what I'm saying, and it connects with something they may have been challenged with their husband, partner, or, 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 or son. But is it, women have to pay attention to men in ways that men don't have to pay attention to women. In a male-dominated society, their survival is, in, is, is, is based on that. It's no different than black folks know a whole lot more about white folks in, in terms of paying attention to them. White folks only have to pay attention to black folks if they feel like it, if, if they want to, or if they think is righteous to do so. But their survival in the United States of America, which remains a race construct, is not required. In a male-dominated society, it's not required for men to pay attention or to have an interest in the experience of women. Women know men, pay attention to men, watch what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. So in, in many respects, they understand us deeper than we understand ourselves. But Tony, I, I got to say, though, because, but I'm talking to a lot of young men, and they say to me, now look at, 
we can't say anything because the women will mm -hmm. bite our head off. That's we can't the, you know, we can't speak up in school. We're accused of being sexist. That's we can't. The, you know, that's bullshit. No, I'm not, <laughs> no, you know what it is? It's, it's real. It happens. Mm -hmm. But what was going on for us at that time? See, equality. Men, when men think of equality, we say, "Okay, we're here. You want equality? Just come on up and join us." That's how. It, come on. That's not how equality happens. Equality happens like this, right? And so for us as men, we feel like. We got, we're, we're losing out. We're giving something up. Something's being taken away from us, you know? So we, we're not embracing the gift in it, you know? We're operating from a place of what are we losing? What is being taken? So when we say, oh, I can't talk, every time I say something, yeah. he wants all to jump in kind on of you. things, that, that's what that's all about. Right, she says I can jump in, Go so ahead, let me jump, jump in. in. Okay, okay. Um, you're making a lot of good points, but it's, it's way too broad a brush to paint all men in America. There is, there, I've spent the past year traveling around interviewing all these dads in my generation who have young children. We are not the stereotype, and there is an army of men around this country that are like us, who want to speak up, who want the opportunity to speak up, who want to be able to have better structures and policies so that we can have more time with our own kids. Look, dads of but young But look kids, at all these figures absolutely. about how tr in trouble men are, and the uh, violence is an but, epidemic and high here, in every way. And here are more figures, okay? Uh, of, of men who have young children in this country, mm -hmm. more than 90% spend three hours a day with them and consider teaching them values more important than anything else they do. The highest, they, the, they are, in our poll today, most men, the highest number was they do not want to be stay-at-home dads, though. Let's just be well, clear. Well, yeah, that. most dads, I mean, and that and is women a structure. Do, a lot of women don't want to be stay-at-home moms. That's so. right. We don't want that. But what we're not touching on here, only one in five of the men in our poll say that expressing emotions is, is, is not manly. Only one in five. What we have is an army of men around who, who are changing, who want to be a part of this change, who don't need us to speechify to them and say, hey, you don't respect women, you don't respect equality, you don't respect uh, any of the... They want the opportunity to make this change, and they are becoming more vocal. The problem is, for these men, they are genuinely afraid to speak up in a lot of situations because they do feel that they come from this place of privilege being men and that they'll be judged if they try to speak at all. And the problem is, the real irony to that, is that if they're afraid to speak up, we will never get anywhere in the fight for equality because men need to be just as much a part of the fight for equality you as they're women they're afraid do. to speak up because they think women will beat them up? What they what? say to me, to, to me directly, and these are direct <laughs> quotes that I have in the book, is they, they fear that women will say, and it's happened to some of them, that women will say to them, well, well, you know, you're a privileged man. What do you know about this? But really, what I have found is that women, and this is where Tony's exactly right, women are the ones welcoming this conversation. Women are saying, you know, and, and it's like Sheryl Sandberg says, what you said, what others say, that, that men need to be welcomed in as part of this conversation so that we can achieve this kind of equality, so that we can get where we need to go. There are men who are Neanderthals. There are men who don't get it. There are men who are not advanced and are, have not evolved and have a long way to go, and there are a, there's a huge crisis of fatherlessness in this country. But the majority of men in this country do not fall under this broad brush of, of not respecting women or not respecting equality or teaching kids in, to, to be unemotional. The fact is, you should see this survey and, and why it's really strong. We wrote about it in the Huffington Post today. Only one in five say that expressing emotions is anything less than manly. So what this means is we I are did, going in a I direction. I did the survey. I know. Oh, I know. I don't no, I know. I'm not telling you. You should see the survey. I'm not telling you. I'm telling them. So okay. the, point, the point is that, that <laughs> there's hope. There's hope for us. There's totally hope. There's hope. There's hope. But your survey that was so great is that you also delineate between men 15 above on average yes. and then 15 below and it's the younger generations that are more advanced in their thinking and more inclusive and, and clearly it requires all of you to continue your work and to dialogue and model and mentor future generations so that they continue the work because so much of this inequality has been institutionalized so it doesn't matter if you want if you interviewed men who want to play a larger role in their children's lives, they can't right now, right? right? So they can't. That also really... depends a lot on economic yes, groups. and 100%. People, the New York Times piece yesterday, 1.5 million African-American men missing. Yeah. Jerry, give us the, just read off your seven principles, would you, of manhood? <laughs> I just, uh, 
And then I want to end with Jackson because I know everybody wants to go eat. Well, you, you know, I just want to mention, you know, something just in terms of, you know, what was talked about in, in terms of men and women. Because, um, you know, the issue of anger and the issue of hate, actually there's dimensions that I mentioned confusion. And when confusion is not remedied, it turns to anger. When you've been, you know, and, and if you don't uh, remedy anger, it turns to hate, right? And hate is disconnection. Right, you disconnect and you begin associating with those people who have similar feelings. But if, if hate is not resolved, it turns to self-hate. It means you begin doing things that are hurtful to you and self-sabotaging those people close to you. And when, when self-hate is not resolved, it turns to rage, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of rage behavior. So principles of a man is a man of his word. You know what I mean? And, and I re man of his word. Man, man of his word. word. Somebody, you know, really follows through. You say you're going to be a dad, be a dad. You say you're going to be there, be there. Be a man uh, and, and a credible word. Second, it has a sense of responsibility for his own well-being and that of all others, right? That's, that sense of, and in our Mayan culture, there's a word called in la quech. In la quech means tú eres mi otro, yo, you're my other me. So you come into my life as a reflection, as a teacher, and, and if I sh show harm to you, it harms me too, right? It's, dis it's interconnected. The third one, it rejects any form of abuse, physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual to himself or others, because a lot of times rejection and shame is, is spiritual, it damages your spirit, right? It takes time to reflect, pray, include ceremony in your life. It's real important. Right? Ritual. Ritual, yeah. ceremony. It's really important to do that and have tradition that way. It's sensitive and understanding, and, and, and that's, that's the really important one, because um, you know, if you're going to have a relationship for a long time, uh, you need to know and begin to understand that you don't understand. Right? And, and many, you know, women, my sister, my mother, everybody's saying, you don't understand, you know. And my wife says, you'll never understand what, what, what it took to have these babies, and you're going to pay me forever. I mean, so, so, <laughs> so and, and that's fine. I don't understand. And, and, but, it, but it's be like a mirror reflecting support and clarity to one another. And that's really important. What do, what do we need to, to give to one another? And then finally, lives these values honestly and with love. And love is a real critical value, right? It, it's a sense of, of, of unconditionally accepting someone. And so when I work with men in prison, when I work with, I went in, in, in the, to prison to Soledad and right before Father's Day and, and, and asked them, how many of your fathers, they all raised their hand. Uh, how many of you love your kids, they all raised their hand. How many of your kids know you love them? And they put their hand down. And I said, well, why? Because I'm so ashamed of what I did. I said, so that interrupts you sharing? And they said, well, I haven't, I didn't think I deserved how many of you know your fathers love you? They put their hands down. I said, can we break the cycle? I said, you have time in here. Can you tell your kids every day? And if you can't send it home, write it. And when you get out, give them a book of you know, three years of you saying, I love you every day. And I guarantee it will change your child's life. So there's little things that we can do that can really incorporate for any, where you're at any place. And, and I work with men that are, that are homeless. And I say, you have a sacredness in you. You have an ability just in your, just where you live, among who you are, to be able to embrace a sacredness and be able to teach and, and reach up and, and reach out and bless and heal. You can do all of that. So. Yeah, beautiful. I hope you'll pass some of those out. We also have some action cards that people can do, which is obviously to ignite a conversation with the men, the women, uh, anybody, any gender in your life to begin a conversation about masculinity, about femininity, about many of the issues explored here today, obviously to screen Jen's film in schools. If you have kids in schools or you know community groups, they can screen this film. There's a curriculum uh, attached to it. And then obviously we hope that people, if you can, you'll mentor uh, one in three uh, kids in this country growing up without a father, a father present. There is so much room for men to model masculinity, to have these conversations. There's a huge need, and I think women kind of do that more naturally, but there is a desperate need for men and boys uh, to have this kind of positive role modeling and positive conversations that they can be their form of masculinity. And Jackson, I'd love for you to kind of wrap it up because you have uh, spoken all over the world about this subject. Are you hopeful? Uh, this is a beautiful film, but it's pretty depressing on many when you read those <laughs> statistics. And um, you know, I'm always a big believer that we can change things. And I think we're right in the middle of a really exciting time for men and women. I was really excited about the poll results where men were defining strength in different ways, wanting to be present, wanting to be emotional, defining the American dream as being present and having being a successful father and son. 
uh, so many more men stepping up to be caregivers. And yet we have, as Tony said, these incredible statistics of violence, uh, domestic violence, physical violence, uh, binge drinking. So what are we to take away? Are you hopeful? What's one thing as we walk out of here that we can be hopeful about and that we can do? Thank you. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate, I appreciate the question and, and the honor of answer, ha having the opportunity to answer the question. Um, well, a couple things. One is I want to honor what Jerry was saying. The wisdom of Jerry's uh, comments is, is fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's one of the things we need to do is be more open to a more spiritually connected understanding of, of manhood, personhood, really, you know, and that's great, great stuff. But I also want to say, and, it, and it's a point of connection between what, um, what Josh and uh, Tony were talking about, which is I think one of, the, one of the hopeful things and one of the great things that has happened to men in a general sense, and I, you know, I know it's class and race and ethnicity and every other category kind of complicates the category of men that I'm referring to. But um, the reason I think why so many good things have been happening in men's lives and why you have some of the good polar results and why Josh's book is articulating that there's lots of men who want to have better connected relationships with their kids and there's structural impediments to that, it, let's be clear, it is the modern multicultural women's movement that's made all this happen. And women's efforts, women's organized efforts, politically, socially, personally, parentally, and every other way, has opened up space for men to be having this conversation. And I think there's dramatic changes that have been happening generationally, again, with all these complications, and I appreciate the complications. But, I mean, let, next month, I think it's May 8th, is the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, which is a, you know, it's a great, it was a great moment, the end of World War II. But World War II and it, it is still present in our culture. And I'm a baby boomer, a late, late baby boomer, but a baby boomer. And you know, my long deceased father, who was a victim of that war, and my, I mean, he was, you know, he lived, then he died after the war. My stepfather, who's deceased as well, was a victim of his generational experience, not just in the war, but in his, the parenting that he got, the bad parenting that he got. And we talk about the greatest generation, right? As like, because they survived the depression and they, they triumphed in World War II. And I have great respect for the men and women who went through all that and gave us the opportunities, many of us, that we have. But there was lots of damage in that generation of men and a lots of emotional absence from the lives of their children. And as some of that was fulfilling what they expected, what they thought was they were supposed to be doing, which is, quote unquote, providing for their family. And again, men who are poor and men who are in jail can't do that. And I appreciate that's where it gets complicated. But I do think that our generation of men, that is baby boomers and after, you know, millennials and all the younger men who've come after, um, because of women's efforts to talk about this stuff and to hold up a critical spotlight to cultural ideologies of manhood and fatherhood and, and engaged fatherhood, I think that our generations, if you will, the post-World War II generations, have been pioneering a new ideas or new ideas about manhood. And it's complicated and difficult. And it's like, like I said earlier, it's a, it's a long-term struggle that we're all engaged in, women and men. I just want to say my son, my son Judah is here. He's 13 years old. And you know, he's he's a great young man, but he's coming up a coming of age with opportunities that I didn't have when I was young, and that we weren't talking about this stuff when I was young. And I'm not even that old. The point is, <laughs> the generational the generational change is happening, yeah. and there is this momentum, and there are more men who are emotionally involved in the lives of our children, and there's more of an expectation that that's a, being a good father than there was in the previous generation. And again, I appreciate that some men cannot do that because of structural circumstances, yeah. racism, poverty, injustice, and all that. And that's, that's true. But I think there is reason for hope. And I think this is a global struggle, too. And, and, and can I just say one last point? I'll try to make it positive, but I have to mention something about the, 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 the discomfort that so many people have in talking honestly about, uh, about g gender in, when, it, when it refers to men is something that we can all change. In other words, there's this great unspoken in the cultural discussion about violence, which is to say very few people in the mainstream want to talk honestly about what's going on. The vast majority of violence is perpetrated by men against women and against other men, and few people want to talk about that. And so you have this mainstream conversation that continues to happen when we have these school shootings or mass killings. We, we say it's mental illness. We say it's uh, availability of guns. And it, it, it's not mental illness and availability of guns. It's masculinity and cultural ideologies of manhood, in some cases, correlating with 
availability of guns or mental illness. But if it was mental illness and guns, then girls would commit 50% of school shootings, and they don't. 99% of school shootings are done by boys and young men. The, 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 the guy who killed himself and 100, presumably 149 other people in the German wings air uh, plane you know, crash, if you yeah. will, that was the mainstream conversation about it is people with mental illness and pilots who have all this power. How many women have done this? Okay, no women have done this that we know of. No women have done this. The point is, let's have it. Let's let's have an honest national conversation about manhood, about cultural complexities of manhood. Let's you know the film is obviously part of that conversation. This conversation is part of that conversation. And if more adult men have the guts, and I say guts because I mean I say it as a challenging way. Maybe it's because I'm you know a guy embedded in the guy culture, right? But <laughs> if more men had the guts to say, you know what? Um, my manhood is not going to be threatened by having an honest conversation. You know, we say in, in Hollywood films or in other places, you know, like, like um, you can't handle the truth. You know, like, like <laughs> let's, 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 let's challenge men to, to, to respond to that. And like, yeah, let's, let's listen to the truth that women speak, that people of color speak about racism. White men have to be, have the courage and strength in, in, included to look at, look honestly at white privilege. And can I, can I also, one last point. I know I'm, I'm filibustering, I'm sorry. It's, I'm I can go on, I'm I can let you go on. It's Brooks Brothers has got the food, so, I'll, okay. I'll, 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 I'll try to wrap it up right here, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, this, this, continual number of shootings by uh, uh, police officers against unarmed young men of color and black men in particular is a, is a symptom of this crisis in white masculinity, to be honest with you. It's not, it's, it's, it, the, the problem has to be looked, we have to look at the, the, the dominant group rather than the, the, the victim group, if you will. And courage and strength to look inward is great courage and strength. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, I hope that, that something that people can take away from that is that we need more adult men cutting, cutting across class, race, and ethnicity who have that courage. There's people in this room who have influence in, not only in your families, but also in your professional lives. And Jennifer's film is one of the, I think, uh, models for how to begin to have this conversation. So we're, we're in good hands. Thank you, Jackson. Thank so you. all of these guys. I hope, uh, thank you all. Congratulations, Jennifer, great job. I hope you all, they, they've got books, they've all written books, they have organizations. Uh, they all are doing incredible work. If you find, uh, if you could buy their books, look into their work. We list organizations that are out there, support them, uh, and support uh, the idea of using your voice at home, in the workplace, politically, socially, economically, and with women. Have fun. Thank you. <laughs>